On behalf of Community Advocates, I'm David Lara, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to America at a Crossroads. You've seen our co-sponsors on the screen for the past few minutes, and we're grateful to them all. Tonight, I'm standing in for my partner, Janice Kamen Resnick, who usually welcomes you. She's overseas and out of internet range. I also speak on behalf of the Executive Committee of Jews United. That is Janice Kamen Resnick, Mel Levine, Zevia Arsofsky, Rabbi Ken Chasen, and Caroline Kenny. Kelly. For those of you who are frequent viewers of this series, you may want to take a look at today's New York Times. It is a powerful article by last week's guest, Brett Stevens, about the insidious impact of replacement theory, the notion that American elites are conspiring to replace so-called real Americans with immigrants from poor countries. That conspiracy lunacy was apparently the inspiration for the young man who gunned down 10 innocents last weekend in Buffalo, New York. Brett's piece is must reading. So is the adjacent op-ed in today's times by Professor Catherine B. Liu of Northwestern University. We had her as a guest last June. She decries the bigoted replacement theory and recounts its sordid pedigree in American history. In coming weeks, we'll have equally exceptional experts, people looked to as authorities by the leading media in the country. Next week on May 25th, we will welcome back former Secretary of Defense and former Chief of the CIA, Leon Panetta, He'll be interviewed by KCRW's Warren Olney. In subsequent weeks, we'll have an all-star lineup that includes Washington Post op-ed columnist Jennifer Rubin with KCRW's Madeline Brand, the New York Times' David Leonhardt with KCPCC's Larry Mantle, the Atlantic and CNN's polling maven Ron Brownstein, and the Washington pundit couple, couple without peer, the New York Times' Peter Baker and his wife, the New Yorker Susan Glasser. We think we've hit the jackpot on speakers. And now to introduce this evening's guest and moderator, my longtime friend and my colleague in this effort, a former congressman who served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Mel Levine. On that committee, he learned to distinguish between true foreign and military policy mavens and so-called experts with little knowledge, nuance, or sophistication. Mel Levine knows the difference and he welcomes a maven here tonight. Mel? Thank you, David. And let me start with a shout out to my colleagues, David and Janice and Zev. It's been an incredible pleasure to work with them in putting together these weekly programs. And yes, David, you're right. Um, Max Boot is a real maven. Um, on the two preeminent stories about America today, in my view, there is no better analyst than Max. Those stories are the threats to American democracy on the one hand, and Russia's unprovoked military aggression in Ukraine on the other. Uh, Max is an indispensable and clear-eyed analyst on both of those subjects. His op-ed today, for example, thanking Vladimir Putin for greatly strengthening NATO is emblematic of his clarity on Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine and his frequent reminders about the imminent threats to our democracy heralded not only by Donald Trump, but now by the entire Republican Party, should be requir required reading for all Americans. Max is making his sixth appearance in our series. He is a respected historian, best-selling author, and foreign policy analyst. He has been called, I think, accurately and fairly, the world's leading, one of the world's leading authorities on armed conflict. He is the Jean J. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a columnist for the Washington Post, and an analyst for CNN. And we are very fortunate to have him back with us this evening. And we warmly welcome him and thank him for joining us. Pat Morrison, our superb moderator, is a Pulitzer Prize winning, longtime terrific columnist for the LA Times, she is a Los Angeles institution. She has won multiple Emmys and Golden Mics for her work on public television and public radio. She has moderated many of our programs and invariably does a superb job. I'm pleased to introduce Pat, who will interview and moderate the program with Max. Pat, it's yours. Thank you, Mel, and thank you, David, and thank you to all the organizations that support these programs and to all of you for watching from literally around the world. The stakes could not be higher in this country and therefore for much of the rest of the world about what happens in the United States. 
in terms of its domestic policy and what happens abroad with its foreign policy. Max, of course, is expert in both of these. And the line that he takes is a familiar one. You've heard it here before from people who say they were Republicans and now have parted company with that party over many issues. We're going to hear about some of them tonight, including the point that is often made that you have to vote for Democrats, as he said in the fall, because the disagreements may be profound over issues of policy, but not when it comes to saving democracy, because that's what we're seeing at stake over and over again. We're going to be talking about the Buffalo massacres tonight. We're going to be talking about yesterday's elections, about Ukraine and NATO, and uh, the January 6th, the upcoming hearings uh, into the, uh, the coup attempt on the Capitol on January 6th. So Max, always a pleasure to talk to you again. Great to be with you, Pat, and, and thanks to Mel and David and, and Janice and everybody else for continuing to organize such a uh, terrific speaking series, which I am privileged to be a part of again. Let's look at what happened in yesterday's elections as a bellwether of the midterm elections and as more evidence that the two parties, particularly the Republican, seem to be engaging in kind of a continental drift farther and farther away from their own centers. I think that's right, although it's not, they're, they're not drifting apart at the same rate. I mean, this is Earth to Elon Musk, uh, who just says, it's like my head explodes every time I see one of Elon's tweets because you know, today he was saying that, uh, that you know, he's uh, becoming a Republican because he used to think that uh, Democrats were the party of, you know, peace and love, but now they're becoming the party of hate and division. Let, let, is... let me, I'll, I'll quote the tweet and we can have it here. Yeah. In the past, yeah. I voted Democrat because they were mostly the kindness party, but they have become the party of division and hate, so I can no longer support them and will vote Republican now watch their dirty tricks campaign against me unfold, end quote. Yeah, this is, it's just kind of amazing that you can be the world's richest man and be completely out of touch with reality uh, because the reality is pretty much nearly the opposite, which is that the Democratic Party, yes, it has an, an ultra liberal wing. There is the Bernie Sanders wing, but they're not in control. The president is Joe Biden. He is a centrist Democrat. You know, Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer are in control in Congress. They are centrist Democrats. So there is no wild-eyed radical far left in charge of the Democratic Party. By contrast, the Republican Party actually has been hijacked by the far right. And it's pretty disturbing to see uh, with the rejection of science, the rejection of democracy itself. And I think you know, you've seen just in the last few days more evidence of the state of the Republican Party. I mean, you look at, for example, at, at Pennsylvania, uh, where the uh, Republican nominee for governor, Doug Mastriano, is a full-on election denier. He's an insurrectionist. He, deny, he refuses to accept that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. He tried to overthrow the election results uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania as a state senator. And the horrifying thing to imagine is what happens if this guy actually wins the governorship? Now, he probably won't because there is a strong Democrat, but what if, the, what if Mastriano actually wins the governorship? There is no way that in 2024, he would ever certify the state of Pennsylvania for a Democrat like Joe Biden. It just would not happen. So you have you know, a nominee of the, of the Republican party who is trying to overthrow our democracy. There is no comparable nominee of the Democratic party who is trying to overthrow our democracy. Democrats are trying to raise the minimum wage. They're trying to you know, spend more money on, they wanna cancel student loans. You can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm actually opposed to that, but it's, it's a reasonable debate to have, but it's not a threat to the, to the fabric of American society in the way that uh, the Republican party has become where 70% of Republicans uh, refuse to accept the results of the last election, which means they're basically rejecting the fundamental tenets of our democracy. Singularly in Pennsylvania, it's the governor who appoints the secretary of state who's in charge of the elections. So essentially, it's a buy one, get one free, get a statewide office for free. Yeah. And he would certainly appoint someone of like mind who would not certify any Democrat, no matter how many votes he or she won by. Right. And the, I mean, the other example of how extreme the Republican Party is getting is the way that replacement theory has found... Uh, a, a welcome audience in Republican ranks. This is the noxious falsehood that there is some kind of plot underway by elites 
call them Democrats, call them globalists, call them Jews, which is, you know, if you read the insane manifesto from the Buffalo terrorist, he was very explicit about saying that the Jews are plotting to bring in immigrants and change the ethnic composition of America. Normally on Fox or in the Republican Party, they're a little more subtle. They don't say the Jews, they say the Democrats, but the, the, the theory is the same. It's insane. You know, Tucker Carlson, who is the most popular television host in America, he is a devotee of, of the Great Replacement Theory. And he, he was, you know, playing footsie with that theory for years. And then last year, he openly embraced it. He actually said, use those words that they're trying to replace us, which is the very same uh, crazy viewpoint uh, shared by the white supremacist gunmen in Buffalo, as previously with white supremacist gunmen in Pittsburgh, El Paso, Christchurch, New Zealand, and elsewhere. And this crazy, insane, racist, white supremacist replacement theory is believed by nearly half of Republicans. So to underline where the Republican Party is today, 70% of Republicans think that Joe Biden stole the election, and almost 50% of Republicans believe there is a plot to introduce uh, uh, immigrants of color into this country to displace the white native-born population. These are both literally insane beliefs, and yet they are widely held within the Republican Party. They've gone from the fringe to the mainstream. So, you know, I wish Elon Musk, among a few other people, would uh, would would uh, you know suddenly realize that that's the reality. That's not what he's saying it is. So, so the Republican Party has finally become a big tent party, but it's all clowns under the tent. From yeah, that's, that's well but, put. So, but, but let's, I mean, to look at bum, how, bum. <laughs> you may use that, yes. Um, oh, let's yeah. look at how, how Donald Trump fared, because this is really Trump's party now. He wow. won in a lot of the races where he had endorsed a candidate that, who looked like he or she had very little chance of winning. Yeah, I mean, I think basically Trump won every single race, even though not every single person that he endorsed actually won. And, you know, why do I say that? Because there was not a single Republican who won uh, yesterday in Pennsylvania or has won any election uh, in, in recently who was actually running against Donald Trump, who was willing to say, I'm going to save America and the Republican Party from Trump and the Trumpists. There is not a single one of those. I mean, he gets to basically choose among various Trumpists. And so in all of these states, there is a keen competition, like, you know, in Ohio, where J.D. Vance won out over Josh Mandel and others for the coveted Trump endorsement, and he won the Republican Senate primary, or, you know, in Pennsylvania, where Dr. Oz, and I can't even say that without laughing, but Dr. Oz won the, uh, uh, the Trump uh, endorsement, and, and it looks like he may, you know, squeak out an arrow win over David McCormick, uh, uh, you know, although I, you know, I don't see anybody screaming fraud, even though the result seems to be changing after election day. But it doesn't make any difference, to my, in my opinion, because McCormick, he's pro-Trump too. I mean, he's actually married to a former official in the Trump White House. So none of these officials are anti-Trump, and the handful that are, like Liz Cheney, are are being targeted uh, by Trump forces, and, and a lot of the others, like Adam Kinzinger and many others, are simply leaving Congress. Do you think that Mastriani has no chance of winning? He's running against a real character of a Democrat named uh, Futterman, who's been in the hospital with a stroke, but he's clearly right. a distinctive figure. Is But is Pennsylvania going to, to go for that? Uh, I, don't, I don't make prognostications about politics. I make, uh, I limit my, my prognostications to foreign policy, and that's where I, I'm proud to be uh, consistently wrong in, in my prognostications. I'm not gonna be wrong. In, in domestic politics as well, but I, I don't, I don't just don't don't know enough about Pennsylvania politics to say. But it does seem like uh, Fetterman is kind of a populist, uh, you know, down home kind of candidate who seems to resonate with a lot of voters. But I, all, all I know is that it's it's a pretty scary prospect if Mastriano wins. Uh, the the Buffalo massacre has pretty much been top of mind for so many reasons, some of which you alluded to. Uh, the man who who went into this store, who had scoped it out, who had looked at other places as well, and had evidently a long list of places he wished to go kill people, had um, the same kind of Bushmaster rifle that was used in the Sandy Hook shootings. He had engraved on the barrel the N word, and the you know here's here's your reparations uh, as he went in shooting. Uh, this 
yet another chilling uh, extreme right, um, insane conspiracy theory driven killer who managed to, to kill almost a dozen uh, citizens of color in this country simply because they were citizens of color in this country. And yet, apart from a few thoughts and prayers, once again, we don't seem to get the kind of outrage across the board that you would expect. It's, it's, it's horrifying because it seems like we're, we keep seeing the same movie over and over and it always has a bad ending and nothing ever seems to change. And it, I mean, I actually read, you know, the, this, this terrorist insane manifesto and he was, you know, talking about how easy it was for him to acquire this assault weapon, even though he's this 18 year old kid, we know that he was investigated as a possible threat to his high school. There are obvious questions about his mental sanity. Uh, there is no way in hell he should be allowed to buy an assault weapon or any kind of weapon, and yet he found it very easy to do so. And, you know, in my opinion, nobody should be allowed to buy an assault weapon. We should ban assault weapons, which is what, you know, countries like Australia and New Zealand have done after mass shootings. But we keep having mass shootings, and it's easier than ever to get a, an assault weapon. And, you know, one of my many concerns about what's happening is that the Supreme Court uh, in a few weeks' time is probably going to uh, overturn a law that we have here in New York that makes it very difficult to get a permit to carry a weapon, uh, you know, on the street. You have to show a cause uh, for why you should be allowed to carry a weapon. And the odds are that the ultra conservative majority on the Supreme Court is going to strike that down. And this is, you know, making it impossible even for blue states to regulate gun sales, although it, it ultimately doesn't matter that much because it's so easy to take, you know, guns across state lines unless we have national regulation, uh, you're gonna continue seeing this horrible plague of violence and you know, gun deaths are at, at, at a new high that we haven't seen in a number of years. Uh, and Republicans just refuse to do anything about it beyond, as you say, thoughts and prayers. And one of their, you know, one of their nostrums is, you know, the way to stop a bad guy with a gun is to give guns to good guys. Well, they tried that in Buffalo and this poor uh, retired police officer who was acting as a security guard at this supermarket he was gunned down by the gunman, even though he tried to shoot at him. That theory doesn't work. How about we just not allow, uh, you know, insane white supremacists to, to go out and buy assault weapons? How about that? Someone tweeted that freedom is not being able to own 25 assault rifles. Freedom is able being able to go shop at a grocery store on Saturday without being murdered. Yeah, that's, that's well put. Yeah. Uh, is there any retreat from this critical or from the replacement theory that seems to be going about? Is, is Fox trying to put any distance or is it just relabeling the same canned content of hatred? They're not even relabeling it. They're, they're doubling down. I mean, uh, you had uh, Blake Masters, the Arizona Republican Senate candidate who was bankrolled by Peter Thiel. He, was, he posted a video a few hours after the Buffalo uh, shooting where he's talking about the replacement theory and talking about how the Democrats are bringing in immigrants. You know, J.D. Vance, who's another one of Peter Thiel's beneficiaries in Ohio, he puts an even more demented twist on this sixth theory where he says, not only are Democrats bringing in uh, immigrants from south of the border to change the demographic balance of the country, but Joe Biden is also allowing fentanyl into the country because he wants to kill MAGA voters in the heartland. I mean, that's literally what J.D. Vance said, this is demented, but this guy is the Repu could could well be the next U.S. Senator from the from the great state of Ohio. And then, of course, you know, Tucker Carlson, his normal act, he was at it again on, on Monday instead of being repentant or doing any kind of self-reflection and saying, hey, maybe I shouldn't be promoting this great replacement theory when it leads people to go out and commit mass murder. Instead, of course, his, you know, his normal spiel is I'm the victim here because People are suggesting that I'm somehow responsible for this violence. That's not true. You know, I don't even know what the replacement theory is. He literally said that, after, even though he's he's mentioned it like 400 times on the air previously. So there is no rethinking. It's just it, it doesn't seem to matter how disastrous the course is. It's full steam ahead. Max Boot is my guest. You can ask him your questions. If you put it in the Q&A box, we'll be able to get to some of the questions a little later in this hour. Go to the Q&A box and pose your question. Tell us who you are and where you're from. And we're glad to add that in too. Um, across the water, we see new developments with Ukraine, especially vis-a-vis -vis NATO, Finland, and Sweden, 
applying for membership, something that would have been perhaps hard to imagine five years ago, but so would the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin, although I'm sure he's had it on his to-do list for a long time. Well, his ost Putin's ostensible justification for attacking Ukraine was its application for NATO membership, even though everybody knew it was not gonna be admitted to NATO, but his, his position seemed to be that having NATO you know, another NATO state on his border would be this such a massive threat to Russia that it had to go out and wage a preemptive war. Well, guess what? As a result of this catastrophic war that he has launched, Russia's border with NATO will now triple. Uh, and uh, with, with you know, Finland alone having more than 830 miles of border with Russia. So this is pretty much the last thing that Putin wants, but it's a huge boon to NATO because both Finland and Sweden are have very capable military forces, Finland in particular. Uh, so they're going to add a lot to the alliance. They're gonna shift the balance of power uh, in, in the North, uh, in the Baltic Sea. It's gonna make the defense of the Baltic Republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, much easier than has been the case. So- Just this logistically, is a, you mean, just being able to have access to- Yes, have, have access to them because country. I mean, not to get too deep into the weeds, but the Russians have a big base at Kaliningrad, uh, which is this Russian enclave wedged between Poland and Lithuania and NATO military planners have been worried for a long time that because of all the weapons that Russia has stockpiled in Kaliningrad, uh, they can essentially dominate the Baltic Sea and cut off the, the Baltic republics from support in the event of war. And now that becomes much harder for the Russians to do because all of a sudden uh, the Baltic becomes basically a NATO lake uh, with, with Finland and Sweden joining the alliance. So this is a huge strategic win for NATO another huge loss for Russia, along with the loss of the, of the Russian economy. And of course, the loss of, of you know, probably over 20,000 Russian soldiers. So Russia is paying a huge cost for its, uh, its uh, unwarranted, unprovoked and illegal uh, and, and frankly evil invasion of Ukraine. The, the attitude toward the Vietnam War in this country shifted remarkably over time. Um, partly because you saw middle-class kids, in some cases, getting shipped off, getting, in, uh, getting drafted and getting killed there, partly because you saw public demonstrations when uh, people of means, middle-class people, began joining the protests. Now, what is the tipping point in a country like Russia, where you already have so much underlying suspicion and disinformation, but you also have the president of Afghanistan and bodies coming home in bags after a very unsuccessful foray into that country. Not that any country is successful in Afghanistan, but, but in Russia, you have a different dynamic. Is there anything that could happen domestically in Russia as this war goes on that could affect Putin, his hold on power and the war itself? That's a great question. It's very hard to know what the answer to that is. I mean, clearly, you're not going to see mass anti-war rallies because anybody who protests the war in public, even with a sign that's blank, winds up getting arrested. I think perhaps the biggest threat to Putin would be if there is a cabal of security service or, or military colonels or even generals who decide that he has uh, put Russia on a reckless path, that he's destroying the army and that he needs to be removed. But you know, even though Putin is a dictator and an increasingly absolute dictator, I think he does worry to some extent about public opinion, which is a reason why he's not ordering a total mobilization of Russian society, which is something that people speculated he might announce on May 9th at the Victory Day uh, ceremony in Red Square. He didn't do that. He's not mobilizing uh, Russian society. He's not calling up the reserves, even though they actually need more troops. They don't have enough troops in Ukraine. And, they're losing the war. But, you know, I think he's afraid of precisely what, what you identified, Pat, is he wants to pretend it's still a special military operation. Everything is going well. No need to worry. And even though he's ginned up a fair amount of support for the war, I think it's fairly thin. And he doesn't want to be in a situation where all of a sudden every little Russian village knows somebody who's died in uh, in Ukraine. I think that is something that would undermine his regime. And I think he's he's concerned about that. Uh, and and you see just the sheer fact that the war doesn't seem to be going as scheduled and you've got Russian troops that are taking smart that are taking the microchips the smart chips out of refrigerators from the houses that they take over in Ukraine in order to to arm themselves and to keep their own 
um, uh, military supplies functioning. That's an extraordinary admission on the part of a country that has a big standing army. But again, we invoke the Potemkin facade. Yeah, it's, it was clearly a, a Potemkin village military that looked very impressive from the outside, which is why a lot of analysts, including in the US intelligence community, overestimated how well the Russians would do. I mean, remember the consensus when Russia invaded on February 24th was that they were going to be in Kiev in, in three days. That was widely believed in, in the West. And of course, never happened uh, because A, because the Ukrainians are much better fighters than a lot of people give them credit for. B, because the West has, in, in particular the U.S., has done a tremendous job of supplying the Ukrainians, getting the weapons to them. But C, you know, number three, the, the other big part of the explanation is that the Russian military just is not as good as, as people thought and not as good as Putin himself thought, I, I'm sure. But, you know, any military is a reflection of society and Russian society is rotten to the core with corruption. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the state is basically a, a mafia type organization where everybody is out for themselves. And I, and I think that ethos has permeated the, the military. So I don't think that uh, there are a lot of Russian soldiers who are eager to die for Putin. And, you know, that they, they don't necessarily, you know, they, they've been giving up at, at, at a pretty high rate when when they've had the, the, the capability to do so. There's been reports of Russian officers refusing orders. So uh, I, you know, morale is pretty low on the Russian ranks and it's very high among the Ukrainians because they're fighting for their homes. We saw a lot of the congressional Republican leadership visiting um, Zelensky over the past week. Does this mean that, that these guys are wrapping themselves in the Ukrainian flag? Some of the same people who voted against uh, impeaching Donald Trump over the call with Zelensky saying, no, we're not going to give you any military supplies anymore, even though Congress voted for them, unless the quid pro quo kicked in. Now, there's some irony there. I mean, I think the good news is that most of the Republican Party is supportive of Ukraine, uh, including the, the leadership in both houses. The bad news is, I think, that the MAGA wing of the party is turning increasingly isolationist, anti-Ukraine, pro-Russia. And you see that with Donald Trump, Tucker Carlson, the Heritage Foundation. There's a lot of influential voices on the right, like Rand Paul, who's been holding up the, the Ukraine uh, aid bill in, in the Senate. There's a lot of influential voices on the right uh, that are just hardcore isolationists. That's still not the majority of, of the party. And if you look at uh, public opinion polls, about two thirds of the Republicans you know, think that we ought to be doing what we're doing to support Ukraine, but about a third don't. And those those are the, the MAGA voters. And, you know, my concern uh, is that uh, although most Republicans disagree with Trump on this issue, uh, because remember, he he welcomed the Russian invasion, saying it was a stroke of genius, brilliant and so forth. Most very, most Republicans don't think that way. But the problem is for them, it's not a make or break issue, which I don't get. I mean, I would not follow uh, as my party leader, a Putin lackey, but even Republicans who don't like Putin don't have seem to have any problem following a a, a former you know a twice impeached former president who tried to uh, you know blackmail Ukraine and, and has always cowed out to Putin. Me, if if I were still a Republican, I would no longer be a Republican. But uh, you know, I reached my breaking point years ago. But it's just shocking to me that it's not a breaking point for Republicans. And the reality is that if Trump comes back in 2024, and he easily could either by hook or by crook, if he gets back into the White House, basically the entire coalition that President Biden has assembled to contain Russia and to impose sanctions and to support Ukraine, it's all going to collapse in an instant. Uh, we have a question from Anna who wonders whether Putin really believes that NATO members are a threat to Russia or is it opposed to justify his actions? Great question. Hard to know. Uh, I mean, my experience is that people who spout BS eventually come to believe their BS. Uh, I mean, there's just that's just a natural human tendency. If you keep saying something long enough, you will convince yourself of that. So um, I do tend to think that he probably does think that NATO is a real threat to Russia. Uh, and in a way it is because his ambition is to restore the former Russian empire and to 
make Russia once again the dominant force in Eastern Europe. And it's true, NATO is standing in the way of doing that. It's frustrating his ambitions. Uh, it's making it hard for him to reverse what he called the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century, which was the breakup of the Soviet Union. You have an opportunity to put your questions to Max Boot. If you'll put them in the Q&A box, we'll try to get to them throughout the course of this discussion. Um, another point that emerged this week was the relationship with, um, uh, with Cuba as Donald, as uh, President uh, Biden has reopened the prospect of remittances flowing from this country to Cuba, which were closed off by Donald Trump and increasing the number of flights available for people to go to Cuba. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know if that's, that, that may be a brave thing to do because, you know, all of Trump's uh, Cuba policies and all of his Venezuela policies as well were basically designed to do one thing, which was to deliver Florida into the Republican column and they achieved that objective. And, you know, I, I think at a, at a substantive level, what, what Biden is doing is correct. I don't think that the U.S. embargo has really done anything to undermine uh, the Cuban communist regime for more than 60 years. And so I think opening up makes sense, uh, but it's going to be very easy for Republicans in Florida, like Marco Rubio and others, to demagogue that in, because they've already been saying, Biden is, you know, pro-communist, that he's imposing communism in America. He, he loves communism. So this is just going to basically feed that narrative. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the calculation on the White House was. Maybe they figured that they're going to lose Florida anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. Or maybe they thought, let's do the right thing despite the political hit we're going to take. But, you know, this is, again, another divergence of where kind of a conflict between good politics and good policy. Uh, but... Is there not a generational shift in Florida by now? The people who came here 60 years ago after the Castro takeover are dead or, or certainly aging, and maybe their children and grandchildren have different points of view about this. Is, is there some real knowledge behind this? Maybe. I mean, I think there is a shift in generational thinking, but there's also been a shift in Florida, which used to be, I mean, Florida used to be one of the most you know, closely fought battleground states, obviously, in the 2000 election, a few chads in Florida made George W. Bush president. And, you know, it's it's been, you know, really a seesaw state, but it really, it's not that anymore. It's actually become more solidly Republican. You know, in 2020, it was not close. I mean, it was Trump won by a solid margin. And, you know, in, I don't think that Democrats are probably going to take the Senate seat or, or, or the governorship. That's a long shot. So, uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're probably right about the generational politics of Cuban immigrants, but, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, Florida is, is, is trending, you know, very heavily into the, into the Republican column. And there's a sense that, uh, you know, being tough on, perceived tough on Cuba and Venezuela, because there's also a lot of Venezuelan exiles now too, but being tough on Cuba and Venezuela is is one way to boost yourself in, in Florida. And certainly that was the only reason Trump paid attention to those issues at all. There's a question from Culver who wonders whether you think the Ukrainians might hold on to Odessa and that Moldova might not be invaded. Well, I think the Ukrainians are certainly holding on to Odessa. I don't see much much chance that Odessa is going to fall. I don't think Moldova is going to be invaded, but, uh, you know, just in the last few days, you've seen the the last of the Ukrainian garrison being evacuated uh, from Mariupol, uh, which is a completely devastated city. You had a heroic last ditch resistance by the dwindling number of, of Ukrainian fighters, and now they, they negotiated a a, a surrender and, and are receiving medical treatment. So what that means is that uh, Russia has secured a land bridge from Crimea uh, to Donbass to the Russian border, uh, and so they have. That's you know that's the that's the biggest new chunk of Ukrainian territory they've added since the invasion, and you know I, I don't think Odessa is in any danger of falling, especially after. Uh, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians sank the Moskva, which is the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. 
But now the challenge for the Ukrainians is going to be, can they dislodge the Russians from this land corridor? Can they take back Mariupol and, and the rest of the land between Crimea and the Donbass? And it, that's not clear yet. I think we're going to get more of a sense over the next month or so as, as the, you know, the Russian offensive in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, the Russian offensive is already running out of steam. And you're going to see, I think, a now that the Ukrainians have integrated American artillery and other weapon systems, they're already starting to go on the on the counteroffensive, and they will, you know, ramp that up over the summer. And so we'll, we don't know what the results of that are, but I think they're, you know, it's still very much in dispute as to how much territory the Russians uh, will be able to hold on to because they're uh, not doing very well, and the Ukrainians are are are, are, are performing much better militarily. Here's a, another question about the realignment in Eastern Europe, an old client state of Hungary. Dina wants to know, what does it signify that the American Conservative Union is having its convention in Hungary and what that says about the American right and maybe some of the common cause it's making? What it says is that the Republican Party is becoming increasingly authoritarian. And there have been a number of academic studies that have been done in the last few years that show that the American Republican Party is no longer like, you know, central right parties in Europe. Like the, it's not like the Tories in the UK or the Christian Democrats in Germany. It's becoming more like uh, the AK party in Turkey or, uh, you know, Viktor Orban's uh, Fidesz party in, in, in Hungary or the uh, Le Pen movement in France. So it's become this populist, radical, authoritarian, movement which is fundamentally hostile to democracy and that's why so many on the right have a love affair with Viktor Orban because I think he is the model that Trump seeks to emulate. Uh, it's not, you know, Hungary still has, you know, ostensibly democratic institutions but the core of democracy has really been destroyed by Orban who stays in power year after year destroying the free press, destroying the independent judiciary, packing the cultural institutions with his cronies, uh, really solidifying his power in a very undemocratic way. I think that is why Tucker Carlson is over the moon about uh, Viktor Orban. I think that's why Donald Trump and so many of these conservatives, that's why they admire him, because I really think that they see him as a model to emulate. And of course, he shares many of their prejudices and plays off them very expertly, you know, attacking LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights, attacking immigrants, uh, claiming that he's a Christian for family values, all this nonsense, which Putin has also engaged in, by the way. But uh, Orban, you know, it, it's a little bit embarrassing right now when you see the war crimes that Putin is committing to be too openly pro-Putin. Uh, I mean, Trump isn't capable of embarrassment, so probably not an issue for him. But for other, you know, Republicans, they don't necessarily want to be gung ho pro Putin when Putin is committing horrendous war crimes. But Orban seems like the kinder, gentler face of right wing authoritarianism. So I think that's why uh, they are embracing him. And you know, in the past, Republicans like the NRA and others, and in a group of Republican senators, have actually gone to Russia uh, because they liked Putin. Now, obviously, they can't go to Russia, but they can go to Budapest. Uh, Herman asks about the US relationship with China apropos of what's going on in Russia right now. And you tend to get the feeling that, that China is watching how NATO is responding to the invasion of Ukraine to assess its own actions that might come against Taiwan. Um, who knows, we may hear the names Kimoy and Matsu surface again <laughs> for the first time in 60 years in a presidential debate. but. Is that how China is regarding this? And is, is there a recalibration of US-Chinese relationship going on now, in part because of that? Clearly, I mean, uh, anytime you have a big war in the world, all sorts of military powers study that conflict to try to learn some lessons. And there is no doubt that the People's Liberation Army in China is, is doing that very thing right now. Now, we don't know exactly what lessons they're learning. Uh, we can speculate, uh, certainly, uh, I would think that at some level, the Russian experience would give them pause before attacking Taiwan because they're seeing how a military that looks pretty formidable on paper doesn't actually perform 
that well in the field. And what Russia is trying to do, which is to invade a neighbor, is much easier than what China would have to do to stage an amphibious assault. This would be the biggest amphibious assault, uh, you know, uh, since D-Day or the Battle of Okinawa, since World War II, the, you know, maybe since in China and the Korean War, but certainly in, in, you know, in 70 years to attack Taiwan, very difficult. And, you know, the Chinese military, like the Russian military, doesn't have a lot of experience with large scale operations. The Russians at least did some smaller scale operations in Syria and Georgia and in uh, Crimea and, and, and elsewhere. But the, the Chinese military really has very little experience. Like the Russians, they have a lot of conscripts whose capacity to fight is, is dubious. So, and, and you're seeing, you know, this very effective, I think, Western sanctions regime mobilized against Russia. And China must realize that because they're even more integrated into the global economy than, than Russia, that they would be even more vulnerable uh, to these kinds of sanctions. So, uh, you know, I would think that on the whole, uh, the lessons for China are to perhaps might make them a little bit warier uh, of attacking Taiwan. The only thing on the other side that I would cite uh, is the fact that they are also seeing that the United States is refusing to engage in direct combat with the Russians because Russia has nuclear weapons. And I think, you know, that's the right decision to make. But, you know, one could easily imagine that th that the Chinese leadership will conclude that the U.S. will never fight for Taiwan because, of course, China has nuclear weapons as well. So very hard to know. We can, we can speculate about how the lessons pro and con or the Ukraine war will be, uh, uh, you know, will be processed in China. We, we just don't know yet, but there is no doubt that the lessons are being processed. One of the, to use the Rumsfeld phrase, uh, known unknowns or unknown knowns, that's floating out there is is COVID and where it's reemerging and what measures are being taken to solve it, suppress it, uh, prevent it. Uh, we just passed the million death mark in the United States. China has some extremely rigid uh, controls going on, uh, sanctions and quarantines going on right now. And so here we have yet another element unbalancing the global economy at a time when it's the last thing we need is more uncertainty. Yeah, we have a lot of crises going on, uh, which are reverberating in the global economy, which is why, you know, one of the reasons why if you if you check your your 401k, it hasn't been doing that well recently. I mean, you certainly see uh, the shock to the global food market and the global oil market because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions that are placed on Russia. But you're also seeing, you know, economic reverberations from the Chinese lockdown in Shanghai and their, you know, very heavy handed totalitarian attempts to stamp out uh, COVID-19, uh, which is causing some backlash internally because I mean, people are like, they can't get food, they can't leave their homes. It's a horrifying situation. I mean, this is kind of the definition of the cure is worse than the disease. And of course, part of the issue is that the Chinese went ahead and developed their own vaccines, which are not nearly as effective as the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. So they don't have the same level of protection uh, that we have. So this is, you know, this is, I would say, score one for European and American science over, over Chinese science, even though we keep hearing about all of China's science and technology achievements. But yeah, no, I think this is a reminder of that, even though, you know, dictatorships can be, can be good at some things, uh, they can also be very, very bad at, at, at you know, tasks that, that you would think they would be good at, like in the case of Russia invading Ukraine or in the case of China controlling COVID. And they're both really mishandling it in ways that I think show the dangers of having a government that is completely unaccountable to the people. I have a question from Terry, um, quoting Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who was in on that famous uh, Zelensky quid pro quo call said we should be giving the Ukrainians air power that they've asked for in spite of Putin's threats and will eventually have to do so. But the longer we wait, the more difficult it makes everything. So what are the complications to doing it now, especially after we have seen that uh, Biden has embraced the modern version of the, the Lend-Lease plan that helped the, the British stave off the uh, Nazis for so long? I think we should do it. I mean, we've already provided a lot to them. It's, it's you know, Ukraine has become the the biggest recipient of, of U.S. military aid in one year 
ever, I think, or at least certainly since World War II, uh, we've provided, you know, providing the artillery and providing the drones and the ammunition and the stingers and javelins, all that stuff, I think, has been very important. But I don't think we should constrain ourselves at this point. I think the two biggest items on the uh, Ukrainian shopping list that they still haven't received, one is, you know, multiple launch rocket systems, which can extend the range of their artillery from 30 miles to 300 miles. And we have this HIMARS system, which is a kind of multiple launch rocket system that the Ukrainians have asked for, and I would hope that we would provide. And of course, their other ask is for fighter aircraft. And there was, you know, a deal earlier on or talk of sending Polish MiG-29s and the administration got cold feet because they didn't want to be too provocative. Or I, I heard various explanations like they were worried that the Ukrainians would use them against Russian territory, or they were just worried about escalation. At this point, I would not, you know, get all wrapped up about it. I would, we've given them so much. I don't think it's going to make any difference to Putin's reaction if we also give them aircraft. And I think, uh, you know, we need to go beyond providing uh, Soviet era military equipment like the MiG 29s. We're already providing howitzers uh, from the US arsenal, 155 millimeter howitzers. From the U.S. arsenal, we're providing U.S. drones, uh, stingers, javelins, all that stuff. I think we should just be, in general, NATO needs to be switching Ukraine over to standard Western military equipment. So don't worry about the, the MiG-29s. Give them F-16s. And yeah, it'll take them a few months to train the pilots. To you know, If they have qualified pilots, it'll take them probably a few months to train and get proficient on the, on the F-16. But let's get started. I mean, if we'd started this when the war broke out, they'd already be flying F-16. So let's not waste any time. And I think if especially if, if this, what you might see is kind of a, uh, in a stalemate by the end of the summer with battle lines stabilized in Ukraine. We're not sure where, but stabilized somewhere. And if that happens, and if there is a lull in the fighting, if there's a ceasefire, that's a great opportunity to retrain a lot of Ukrainians, move in a lot of Western equipment, and get them up to NATO standard uh, 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 weaponry. Max, I hope you'll be gratified to know we have about 350 questions for you. Obviously, we can't get to <laughs> all of gotta, them. I got to have shorter answers. Okay. <laughs> but about the upcoming hearings into the January 6th coup attempt, um, the, the model we have, I guess the, the, the biggest model, the gold standard is the Watergate hearings that change the public's mind about uh, the Nixon administration and its conduct and change the minds of Republicans in Congress as well. Um, do you hold out any hopes that revelations coming out of these hearings will do anything like the same? No. I mean, remember the only reason, actually most Republicans stuck with Nixon, the only reason Republicans abandoned him at the end was when the smoking gun tapes emerged in August of 1974. That was literally the, having Nixon on tape you know, plotting the cover-up. Today, I don't think even that would make any difference. You could have- We, have, we have a smoking gun already, don't we? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you have, there's so much smoke you can barely see, nobody cares. You know, Trump, uh, I mean, this is like, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, grab them by the you know what tape, which came out in, in, uh, in the 2016 election. I mean, Trump says it's not me, doesn't matter, whatever. There's always going to be some excuse at this point. I, the Republican Party is such a cult of personality. I just don't think there's anything that could emerge from this hearing that could possibly shake uh, the Republican uh, devotion to Trump. The best we can hope for is maybe it will move some independents uh, to understand the threat that we're facing and to vote against Republicans. Uh, so many questions along the lines of the one that Paul wants to know about the 50% of Republicans who support re believe in replacement theory, 70% believing that Biden did not win the election. So, and other people concerned about Fox and the big lie that's perpetrated in part by repetition. What is the solution or plural solutions to any of these? How can Americans be brought down from, from this uh, sort of poisonous helium of, uh, of these crazy theories and notions that they research by looking into other crazy theorists? Well, I know what, what the solution is not. It's not to have Elon Musk buy Twitter and open Twitter up to Trump and more of these loonies uh, propagating these insane lies. That would make the situation even worse. Now, what is the solution? Very hard to say. I mean, ultimately, 
you would hope that the solution would be a sudden outbreak of responsibility at places like uh, Fox News, Facebook, and the Republican Party. But, you know, clearly I'm not holding my breath waiting for that to happen. I mean, the, even when, when Tucker Carlson out and out is advocating this white supremacist replacement theory, Lachlan Murdoch is still defending him. Obviously, what you see in the Republican Party, instead of trying to embrace responsibility, it's really a race to the bottom. And it's been interesting to see uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanak, who is now number three in the House Republican leadership, who is a you know Harvard graduate, once from upstate New York, thought of as being kind of a responsible, moderate Republican. And now she's embracing replacement theory. She's sending you know batshit crazy tweets out because that's what she you know she thinks that's what you have to do to get in the Republican Party today, and she's probably right. Uh, you know, I just don't know any short-term solution to any of these problems, which is why what I said in my column like a week ago, which I've said in the past is, you've got to vote for Democrats. You just can't trust Republicans. And it doesn't matter if you disagree with Democrats on some issues. I, I disagree with them on some issues. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a former Republican turned independent. But I just think that to save our democracy, this party cannot be in power. And I really worry about what happens if Democrats lose control of the House Will a Republican House ever certify uh, a Democrat like Joe Biden to win the next presidential election? I have some grave doubts on that score. And yet it doesn't seem that for a lot of voters, certainly even Democratic voters, that the, the existential risk to democracy in this country is top of mind. No, it's not. This is what drives me to distraction. This is, you know, I had a lot of hair when this started. I just pulled out all my hair. Uh, but it's it's really driving me nuts because, you know, the American pattern is we are pretty complacent until we suffer some horrible tragedy like Pearl Harbor, like September 11th, and then we wake up and do something about it. But we already had our Pearl Harbor. We had our, not, you know, our September 11th. We had it on January 6th of 2021. We had the Capitol stormed by insurrectionists. This is an event that has never happened before in American history. And instead of being a wake up call, we kind of hit the snooze button and went right back to sleep. Most Republicans, of course, far from disavowing Trump, as I once naively hoped, have now embraced him and therefore decided that inciting an insurrection is no big deal. But as you suggest, Democrats are not alarmed enough about this. There was a poll by CNN in January, which showed that only 46% of Democrats think that there is a real threat to our democracy. They're not. They're not paying attention. And Democrats, it's kind of a, uh, you know, Democrats are not running on the issue of democracy promotion uh, because polls are showing that voters don't care that much. They're focused on inflation. They're focused on abortion and other issues. Those are all important issues. But this is our democracy we're talking about. And I feel like it's kind of circular reasoning because the reason why voters are not focused enough on it is because Democratic leaders are not talking enough about it. And therefore, we've moved on to other issues, and we're kind of sleepwalking to disaster. Uh, Bruce says he thinks that the press, too, by especially using the uh, false equivalents and looking at all elections as a horse race, doesn't emphasize the, the gravity of this enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's true. Um, the, uh, the, the upcoming election will also have, as part of the package of influential matters, the pending Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade. Do you think it will waken Democrats and independents more than perhaps the risk to democracy, although it's a very, very much a canary in the mine shaft as far as democracy goes? Yeah, I mean, I think this will, you know, assuming that they rule as, as the Justice Alito draft opinion suggests and that they overrule Roe, I think this will be another uh, act that delegitimizes our, our democracy, because, you know, here you have a Supreme Court uh, made up of, ju of Republican justices who were primarily appointed by presidents who, in, who did not win the popular vote. Uh, and of course, you have a Senate uh, with Republican senators uh, representing about 20 million or, or more fewer constituents than Democrats. Uh, there is just such an anti-democratic, both small and, and, and big anti-democratic bias within the Electoral College and the Senate, which is baked into the Constitution, essentially, uh, that it means 
we are really facing this uh, tyranny by the minority, and there's no easy way to break out of it, of course, with the way, and, and, and it's exacerbated by the fact that Mitch McConnell so blatantly disregarded precedent, refused to give uh, Merrick Garland a hearing in an election year, and then rushed a Republican nominee to confirmation right before the election. And all of these Republican justices also basically misled the Senate about their views because uh, in their confirmation hearings, they all claimed that they believed in stare decisis and in, 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 in upholding precedent, and clearly they don't at all. So, you know, if they make this very radical change, which will result in abortion being illegal in about half of the states very quickly, I think this is yet another thing that, that causes faith in our government to plummet. It's already plummeted pretty low on the right. Now it's going to plummet pretty low on the left. The only issue, as you suggest, is, you know, what is going to be the electoral impact? And I would hope that it would be a wake-up call to Democrats to get out there and, and vote and, and to independents and especially you know, to Republican soccer moms to protect their rights and, and vote for Democrats. But I, I can't say I'm all that optimistic because I feel like the people who are going to be the most energized by this decision are folks like in my state of New York or, in, you know, my, my, my former home state of California. It's not necessarily going to be in the swing states where it's actually going to matter. Uh, and of course, we are worried about the fact that it may turn out that, that there's no reverse to this process, that once we go into the quicksand of this kind of single party rule that there's not going to be uh, any either right. backwards or forwards anyway yeah. out of it. So no, I mean I, I if Trump gets elected in 2024, I I you know I think we're going to be in an Orban type of situation. Um I don't know how concerned you are. I think many Americans are concerned that Representative Andre Carson, the Democrat from Indiana, is calling for hearings into UFOs. <laughs> I'll let you I'll let you go out on a high note as we approach the end of our hour. Yeah, you know, we have real threats that we're facing in this country, but Congress is, there's like people in Congress who are fixated on UFOs. I, I don't know well, what to say. Maybe it'll be like the movie Independence Day, where everybody will unite and sing Kumbaya if the aliens start to threaten the whole planet, huh? Maybe that is the only way out of this. I will say that, you know, you can't be too pessimistic or too negative about the prospects for democracy, because I think the entire world has really been impressed and cheered by the way the Ukrainians are are, are fighting and, and sacrificing for our shared values, the things that we all believe in. Uh, you know, in, in America, half of the eligible voters can't even be bothered to vote, whereas in Ukraine, everybody's grabbing a gun, they're going out defending their homes, they're risking their lives, they're sacrificing their lives, they're fighting for freedom, for democracy, all the things that we believe in. And you know, we're standing with them. I think NATO is stronger than ever and in support of them, the West is rallying to their cause. So, you know, I, I think that's an indication that democracy is not done yet. We still got some fight in us. Could, could Ukraine paradoxically help to be the saving of US democracy? Maybe, although it would be a terrible irony if democracy is preserved in Ukraine while we're losing it here. Well, we have about a minute or so for you to end on what we hope is a little bit of an upbeat, hopeful note. Well, that was my that was my, well, that that was was my hope, <laughs> talking about Ukraine. That that's 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 my hopeful upbeat note. Any, I mean, and remember, this is so it. this is so unexpected. Nobody thought that months into the invasion that the Ukrainians would be prevailing. This is really, you know, a, an underdog kind of story. I mean, this is like Star Wars, where the rebels are blowing up the Death Star. I mean, this is. This is kind of the classic American underdog story where, and it's really, I mean, I don't want to be simplistic here, but this is a battle of good and evil. I mean, this is what the Russians are doing is truly evil, truly monstrous. And it's just really cheering to see the way that the Ukrainians are standing up and fighting and not just for national independence, but for their democracy. And I think the country will, it may lose a little territory, but I think the Ukrainian democracy will actually uh, emerge out of this stronger than ever and certainly the way that President Zelensky has become a world hero, nobody expected that. It's really an indication of how a seemingly ordinary person can truly rise in a heroic way to the, to the occasion. Max, thank you as always. I'm sure we'll see you back here again, and I always enjoy talking to you. Thank, thank you, you, very you so much. much. Max Boot. Now, next week, um, you want to come back and join us for Warren Olney, who's interviewing Leon Panetta. Leon Panetta was the White House Chief of Staff, a member of Congress, head of the CIA, and Secretary of Defense 
for a number of democratic uh, administrations and his insights on world events of the sort you've just been listening to tonight will be very valuable for you. That's next week, Wednesday, May 25th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks to all of you. Good health and safety. And thanks again to all the sponsors of these excellent programs. I'm Pat Molesons.